folks to come in. Why don't we go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself, what, you're, what, what you do, if you're involved in the industry or just uh, whatever you're involved in right now. Can we do that since we got a small group? Why don't we start back here? Okay, great. Good. How about you? Hi, my name is Joan Kroll, and I am a professor at the Business School at St. John's University in New York. Oh, wow. And um, I teach marketing, and I'm also an author and a speaker and a writer. Uh, I'm a blogger as well. Wow. What motivated you to come to this? I'm actually speaking on a panel tomorrow. Oh, okay. All right. And what's your topic? Uh, I'll be talking about the business aspects of gaming and particularly Christian um, segmentation. Okay, great. How about you? Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I came uh, here with a friend of mine who is getting into uh, building a game. And uh, I actually am not, all my background is in building. Um, I own a kitchen cabinet firm in British Columbia. And, uh, and I was just interested in how all the aspects were going to tie together. So mm. I just came along for the ride. Okay. Uh, I was really interested in this kind of thing too. So. Okay, good. Um, my name is Dan, and uh, I also um, don't have experience in this industry. I built homes, single family homes. So we've got a cabinet maker and a home builder here. <laughs> <laughs> Supporting, supporting our friend who I only met him about six months ago. But, um, he's building what it is is it's a, a an interactive web game for kids age six to ten, and um, it's uh, it's going to have content that is encouraging biblical values. But we're trying to take away that whole segmentation of secular versus Christian. It's more like we're um, we're trying to help him develop a business model to launch this game because the artwork is just amazing and, and his vision is amazing. And so we're, we're kind of here to help him with the business model of things. And he, he recently asked me to come on um, in an official capacity as director of business development. So, oh. so really interested in helping him to get this game and brand launched. So, so that's... Very interesting. That's why, why both of us are here. Okay. Yeah. How about you? Uh, my name's Rustin. I'm California, and I've been in the video game industry about 11 plus years, and started out reviewing games, sports games, and then, uh, and then I worked for 2K Sports for the majority of the time after that, making NBA, NFL, baseball, and all that. And now I'm with a small startup doing social games. We have one game on Facebook called Men's and Legends. It's a uh, strategy war game. Um, but I'm a Christian, and uh, the CEO is a Christian, so we want to see, you know, what is out there and how we can get more involved. Wow. And you're based where? San Francisco. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm Beth. <coughs> Not a gamer, <laughs> but um, have a vision for the Seven Mountains, and uh, that's been on our heart for years is to see cities and nations transformed. And so we're excited about what you're doing and uh, how it would fit into the whole scheme of influencing a culture. So we're excited to be here. And I'm Henry. We're together. Uh, we actually are from Seattle and uh, not far up the road here. So when we uh, we were on uh, Oz's web website and saw that he was going to be in the vicinity, we thought, hey, it's a great time to, uh, to see what he's doing and connect with him. So we just had lunch together. So we're, uh, yeah, we're really interested in what's doing there, and then uh, we also have friends that are really here, and so we can see friends that sneak down this way. So we drove down this morning, so we'll be back tonight. All right. Well, very good. Well, um, in, in this session, what we're going to be talking about is the six stages of a call of a change agent, and, that, and this might not seem relevant to gaming, but I actually... Anything's relevant to your relationship to God and, and, and how he 
works in the life of a believer. And uh, we'll contextualize it a little bit in the context of technology, but um, for the most part, this session is really talking about your journey uh, with God and how he works in the life of a believer and a, to make you a change agent. And so as we get started on this session, is there any difference between an entrepreneur and a Christian entrepreneur? <laughs> I may agree that there is a difference, right? Take a look at a little humorous clip that I think exemplifies this idea. So I, I saw that commercial. I was sitting in a hotel room in Indonesia, uh, and all of a sudden this commercial comes on. I said, oh my gosh, that's a Christian entrepreneur. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so what is a change agent? Well, it's really someone who impacts the status quo through their influence, either negatively or positively. You know, I think we could all agree that Plato and Charles Darwin and Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein were all change agents, but not, not good change agents. They definitely impacted culture. Abraham Kuyper was a change agent uh, for the Netherlands. He was, an, he was the uh, prime minister from 1837 to 1920. He was one of the few people uh, over history who have understood the seven mountains in a very distinct way where he um, he was a businessman theologian he was into social reform all these things and and he really brought the gospel in the seven sectors he made this wonderful quote he said oh no single piece of our mental world is to be hermetically sealed off from the rest there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. That great, great uh, quote. Rosa Parks certainly was a change agent. She decided in 1955 not to give up her seat in the back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. As a result, a 26-year-old young man stood in the gap and took up a cause. Martin Luther King. We forget how young he was, 26 years old. Change agents not limited to age, race, position, or economic status. We remember a few years ago, this young man, James O'Keefe, 25 years old, decided to take a camera and go behind the scenes with Acorn and pose as someone that was wanting to do um, you know, basically prostitution, you know, and uh, it removed all of the funding of the government to ACORN as a result. Here's one man in a camera. How does God prepare a change agent? Well, there's a number of steps. This morning I talked about recruitment was a stage where it in, involves us in a process then there's the character building stage, there's the isolation phase, there's the cross phase, then there's the problem solving phase when we start moving in the fruit of our calling, and then there is the network phase. So let's begin with the first one, recruitment through divine circumstances. You know, Moses had that burning bush experience. After 80 years of preparation, God decides to speak to him at that burning bush. 
tells him he, he's called to deliver a people. Then there's King Saul. He's out in the desert trying to find his lost donkeys working for his fa fa father's family business. And uh, can't find him after three days. His servant says, hey, there's a, there's a guy, that, the prophet in the city. I bet he could help us find these donkeys. <laughs> they go in the city. And Samuel says, this is not about your lost donkeys. This is about a call on your life to be king. So many times circumstances draft us into a destiny. Paul, blinded on the road to Damascus, is a Pharisee. Jesus himself comes and speaks to him, blinds him, moves him into a destiny. Several years ago, uh, I was on the island of Cyprus. I was invited there by a mentor. And uh, I was very much in my pit. Finances were, were very challenging, and a man invited me to come there. And uh, the next day, uh, after not having the resources, a man called me and said, what are you doing the next day, to, you know, tomorrow? He said, I want you to drive to the airport with me to talk about something. He said, did you know that as we're driving to the airport, we're picking up a man named Dave? And he says to me, we thought it'd be a great idea if we could take you to this conference that's going to be on the island of Cyprus that Gunnar Olson's having and have you teach your material. He said, what would you think? I said, well, it's, that's incredible. I, I just now found out about it 24 hours ago. I go there, end up going there. They cover my cost to go there. And I meet a man there and he comes to me and says, and I had at this time was had lost over half a million dollars through a, a business loss and uh, family and just a number of business things going on in my life and personal things. And man comes up to me after a meeting and says, I never met him, he's from England. He said, the Lord had to remove your finances to reserve the reward he has for you in heaven. It was an encounter, it was a, a divine appointment that the Lord was saying, I know about your situation. I'm not solving it yet but I am there in the midst of it. So often that is the way God's process works in raising us into the destiny he has for us. So often it's through a conflict. David comes, he's just delivering food. He's a caterer. And within one afternoon, he goes from delivering food to delivering a nation, doesn't he? With this conflict of Goliath and he stands in the gap. Martin Luther the, with the Catholic Church. All of a sudden, Martin Luther's struggling with his own faith decision. How, do, how does how does faith relate to salvation? And he's struggling with what he'd been taught in his tradition. And so he wrestles with that. And little did he know he was going to be the father of the Protestant Reformation. He didn't grow up one day thinking, I'm going to be the father of the Protestant Reformation. He was drafted into a situation as a conflict arose. William Wallace, similar thing with England, fighting a, a tyrannical king of England and ends up being one of the deliverers for Scotland. William Wilberforce, a slavery. His conscience would not allow him for his nation to continue on in slavery. And so for over 30 years, he begins to fight this idea of slavery and becomes a change agent for his nation. Of course, Martin Luther King and the civil rights. Change agents are rarely looking to be change agents. We don't grow up thinking that we're going to be change agents. It's a desire for us to have purpose that we talked about this morning. We all have an innate desire to have meaning and purpose and value in why God created us. But we never realize what we can be in terms of changing culture. I like what Henry Blackaby says here. He says, you never find God asking persons to dream up what they want to do for him. When God starts to do something in the world, he takes the initiative to come and talk to somebody. For some divine reason, he has chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his purposes. 
how many of you went through his series Experiencing God? Anybody go through that years ago? If you've never gone through it, I encourage you to go through it. It's really good. He talks about we join God in what he is doing rather than thinking of us to do something. The second part of this now is character development. There's often time of adversity, betrayal, and waiting, and perseverance in our journey. And of course, Dave, uh, the, uh, Joseph was certainly a, a perfect example of that. Now Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how does God allow us to have our mind renewed? How do, how do we come out of the old stuff? One of the things I discovered uh, years ago is that both God and Satan want you dead, but for different reasons, you know? God wants to kill your old man so that Christ can live in us. Galatians 2.20 talks about, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And Satan wants to kill your destiny, it says in Peter, that he wants to kill and destroy. And so I, he tried to kill Jesus at birth, he tried to kill Moses at birth. If he can't try to, if he doesn't <coughs> kill you at birth, then he will try to wound you so badly in childhood that you'll grow up so dysfunctional you'll not be able to relate to God or your fellow man. And so that's his assignment against us. And so God takes us through the journey and so for many of us, especially those of us in the marketplace, we often grow up as slaves and orphans. Now we're born with a heart toward God. You know, that heart is there. It's a pure heart. But through life and the experiences we have in life, many times we become slaves and orphans because of the wounds and childhood things that happen to us. And it says in... Um, Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so this whole idea of sweat and toil, representative of Egypt, living as slaves and orphans. And so God allows a crisis to happen in our life. And that crisis is designed to bring us back to the place of the womb so that we can move away from being slaves to being really sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. Now along the way, so many times what happens is that we have these faith experiences. And a faith experience is when God shows up in your situation, just like that experience in Cyprus. It was a faith experience where I, I really saw the activity of God in a very personal way. And I've had many, many of those. The whole journey is God's trying to move us out of Egypt into the promised land, into sonship and intimacy with him. That's the goal. And if you remember in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 9, the, the, the Israelites are going into the promised land and all of a sudden they're, they're winning all their battles. And the Gibeonites heard about this and they said, well, these guys are going to knock us off next. And you, we're the next on the chopping block and said, the only way we're going to survive it is if we make a peace treaty with these guys. So they come and dress up in old clothes and say, Joshua, we're just passing through. Would you make a peace treaty with us that we might live in peace with you? Well, it says that, uh, that uh, he failed to ask. The men of Israel sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord about the Gibeonites. And they ended up entering into a peace treaty with them. Well, even though it was done under a deceitful manner, God held them to hold that covenant, for them to honor the covenant. That's one of the things that, that I've discovered over the many years is that how important covenant is from God's perspective. Culture today has moved to live based on contract. Contract says, I'll do for you if you'll do for me. If you agree to do this, I'll do this and vice versa. But covenant fulfills what you say to that person regardless of what that other person does back to you. And that's really the gospel. The gospel is faithfulness in the sight of unfaithfulness. 
It's a, it's a Jesus who's loving a bride who will not even love him back many times. And so that's really one of the issues that's going on in our culture is that we've not understood covenant in the context of living it out to express the life of Jesus in the culture. So ultimately, God's trying to get us to the cross, to the end of ourselves, so that he can live through us. And therefore, he restores us. And, and many times that Gibeonite ruse will show up on the other side of the adversity where we become overconfident. And that's really what, what was going on with them, is that they were overconfident and uh, didn't have to ask ab about the situation. And so many times God leaves us in this process in very difficult challenges in our life. Longer because he's trying to create a nature change in us, not just a habit change. And sometimes if we're only in there a few months, there's a habit change, but not a nature change. And so God's, God's trying to do that in us. So as they're going into the promised land, there were actually 39 battles they had to fight. Doesn't mean that just because you cross over, you're, not gonna ha you're gonna have it easy. There were 30, they had to take the land. They had to really engage the enemy. And that required the faith experiences and obedience and manifesting his presence and solving societal problems is another aspect of this whole journey. Really, that's what God's called you and I to do is be problem solvers. Culture doesn't care who solves the problem. They just want their problem solved. If we are able to solve their problem, then we become the influencers of culture. When Deuteronomy talked about Deuteronomy 28 says, I, I want you to be the head, not the tail. And, and Israel, he wanted them to be the head, not the tail, but because they got in so much idol worship, they got off the path. But ultimately what he wanted to do is do that by solving problems. And when you begin solving problems in society, you begin to have influence in culture as a byproduct. We thought that we could have influence in culture by political activism or um, you know, boycotting things or this and that. And really, the way we do it is the way Jesus did it. He solved problems in people's lives. The Samaritan woman, he spoke into her life. The man who was blind, he, he put mud on the eye. He, he told a, a general to go wash in a lake. You know, solve the problem, and then you have the influence. That leads to transform life, transform work, transform city, transform nation. Ultimately, you become a son or a daughter and you enter into your own destiny in the promised land. Now Joseph had the Joseph calling. The Joseph calling is a calling in which your life is defined by adversity. You know, when, think of, when someone thinks of your name, they think of the adversity surrounding your name. God used that 13 year adversity to make Joseph a spiritual and a physical provider through that adversity. And he had four big tests on his way to becoming the most influential man in the, that region of the world. The first one was betrayal. He had a vision, but those that closest to him betrayed him. And so often I've seen in leadership, you know, the Judas test is that first test of real leadership. Are you willing to wash the feet of Judas? Are you willing to love your enemies? That's a tough one, isn't it? Then there was the sexual test where he, he came in that situation, Potiphar's wife's trying to, to come after him and he does the only thing you really can do, you had to flee, he had to flee. And he passed that test. And then perseverance. Imagine being in there, you, you're wrongly accused, you're not supposed to be there. And he's in there for many, many years. And then all of a sudden he has the opportunity to get out through this cupbearer and he interprets the dream for the cupbearer and he says now remember me for I've done nothing to deserve this well he stayed in there two more years I think God wasn't quite done with him and then stewardship would Joseph come back now and try to make things right would he pay back that cupbearer for getting him would he pay back his his brothers but he paid back all those who had wronged him. No, he didn't. He really operated as Jesus operated in that situation. So, personal crisis is often the first chapter of the larger story of our lives. 
it becomes the entry point many times. Only Jesus made plan A. God makes our B and C plan his A plan. God is such a redemptive God that no matter how bad you blow it, like David, gosh, have you ever really thought about David? I mean, if he, were, if he did what he did today, he'd be in prison, wouldn't he? <laughs> and he would be a maligned by the church. He would be, you know, judged. He couldn't get a new job in, a, in anything that was Christian. I mean, he really... And yet God saw something in David that said, his heart, I love his heart. Because he was, he was something we call a simple fool. There's four types of fools in Proverbs. And the first one is called simple fool. And that's someone who learned from his mistakes. That was not a negative term. It was actually, the sages called that person someone who was, had wisdom. Because they made a mistake, but they learned from their mistake. And then there was a second type of fool that didn't, didn't learn from their mistakes, and that was Saul. He was a hardened fool. And then there was a God-denying fool. So the, what we want to be is simple fools. The third phase is the isolation period. God initiates a time of separation from past dependencies to realign values. And I began to see this pattern in all of the leaders in the scriptures and many people God has used in the kingdom, there was often a time where we were isolated, set aside in an, almost an isolation chamber. Like David, therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adalim, 1 Samuel 12, 22, 1. Remember David when the, all of a sudden Saul really starts to come after him. And and, I mean, he's really losing, he's losing his mind. He goes to the city of Gath, which is where Goliath was from. And he, and he fakes madness before the king there. And uh, the, the king sees this, this guy's a, a wreck. You know, I don't even need to mess with this guy. And he, then he goes into the cave of Adalim. It's, it's really the low point of David's life. Um, and I'm sure David was asking, what, what happened now, what about this time where I was anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel? And here I am as a fugitive, wandering. What we see in that is God turns messes into messages and messengers. Isaiah 45, 3 says, I'll give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who calls you by name, the God of Israel. You see, one of the things that happens in these isolation periods is he reveals secret things to us in hidden places. And that's why I began writing the devotional TGIF and why it's affected so many people is I wrote it in a very dark place. And he was taking me to the depth to really discover the nuggets of truth. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. What do you hear in the ear? Preach on the housetops, it says in Matthew. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence, Psalm 31, 20. By the way, many of these presentations are on our website. You can actually download these at marketplaceleaders.org, and uh, you'll find them there. John Bunyan Pilgrim, wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He was 12 years in prison for preaching the gospel says he delivers the poor in their affliction and opens their ears in oppression. Isn't that an interesting phrase? He opens our ears in the oppression. The Apostle John was banished on the island of Patmos. He wrote the book of Revelation on that island. Paul was hidden away for three years before he began his ministry. We don't hear much about what happened there in Arabia. How about Nelson Mandela, South Africa? Waited 27 years in prison, went from the prison to the palace, didn't he? What a Joseph story that was. How about Elijah after fleeing for his life from Jezebel? Where the Lord came to him in the cave. What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> 
He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings the shadow of death to light. Job 12, 22. Now, many of us are familiar with Jeremiah 33, 3. We're, we've heard it many, many times. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. But rarely do we look at the first part of that verse. Look at the circumstances by which he received that. While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guards, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. So he was in an isolation period. Daniel said he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Now David wrote Psalm 34, 57 and 142 while he was in the cave of Adullam. Another example of revealing secret things in hidden places. If God calls us into darkness in order to enter his presence, then that darkness will become an entry to new levels of relationship with a God who longs for fellowship with you and me. I can't tell you how many times the Lord has allowed me to write in those seasons of darkness, of isolation. There's also the waiting period, too. Abraham had to wait for Isaac. Moses had to wait 40 years before God spoke to him again. Joseph waited 13 years until he was freed from captivity to begin, interesting enough, a 81-year career in that position in Egypt. Elijah waited beside the brook at Cherith. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. It's really a challenge to us to, to trust God with the timing of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. So a personal cross is the fourth stage. God takes the change agent through those series of character tests designed to develop humility, trust, and intimacy with God. But ultimately, He's trying to get us really to the end of ourselves. So I gave you this verse, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In order that Jesus' life can live through us. Now, one of the things I've discovered about the cross is that even if you have a desire to let the cross have its way in your life, you can only put two nails in. It usually requires a third person to put the third nail in. And usually what happens is some circumstances, some betrayal. For Jesus, it was Judas. For David, it was Absalom. For Joseph, it was his brothers. Totally were the instruments to bring him totally to the end of himself. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Jesus learned obedience from the things he suffered. So the higher you go up on the mountain of influence, the greater the scrutiny. Such was the case with Moses, where God has invested in his life 80 years. But he fails to do one thing. He's on his way now to fulfill his assignment. And he fails to do one thing. He fails to circumcise his child. And God is going to kill him over that. Now, when I think about that, I remember the first time I ever read that, I got angry. I said, God, that's awfully picky. You've invested this much in this life, and you're going to kill him over that. But what we see in that is the incredible value God places on covenant. Because what he was wanting to happen this covenant that was made with Abraham years earlier, circumcision was a picture and a physical evidence of that. And so God was saying, this sign is so important for us, for you to uphold covenant between me and Abraham and what I'm doing through you. So now we move into the phase once God's prepared us and he he gets all that stuff out of us. He gets all the flesh. And he's beginning to move us into our destiny. 
And that's when we become problem solvers through invention and entrepreneurship. And that's where we talked about David. You know, he, he had this idea, went from delivering food to del delivering a nation. What's interesting about that story is David, even though he was young in years, he was evidently a, a good little businessman because he asked questions about that situation. He said, what will be done for the man who, who defeats Goliath? What's the benefit? Now, all of us in business ask that question. We say, what's the benefit if I take this risk or enter into this situation? Well, he'll get the king's daughter. He won't have to pay taxes. He'll have great wealth. And David understood covenant. What did he say to that Philistine? He said, you uncircumcised Philistine. Who are you to stand against the God of Israel? See, he had something on his side. He knew the covenant promise of God over their nation. Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? That was David's employer. David came up with, uh, not David, Joseph. He had come up with solutions. So God gave him a solution. That's what we're talking about this morning. What kind of creative solution will God give you for your creative project or whatever it is that you're involved in? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge. You become a solution to a situation whether it's your teacher or someone you work for, um, your city. We tell people in city transformation, go to the mayor, ask him what his greatest problem is, and then become a solution to it through collective influence of churches and marketplace and intercession. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. What a picture. This morning we talked about Johann Gutenberg, where God gave him the invention of the printing press and how it influenced, and even today, influences the world. There was a man who was the vice VP of Disney. And his boss came to him one time and said, We're going to start cruise ships, and I want gambling on those cruise ships. Well, this man was a Christian, and he thought that would be really bad, not only for the brand, but what it would do. So after praying about it, he came back to his boss, Eisner, and said, If I could come up with an idea that would give you the same revenue that was not gambling, would you be open to it? He said, yeah, but you, there's no way you're going to do that. He prayed about it, and God gave him an idea. As a result, gambling did not get on cruise ships for the Disney product. That's the way we're to do it in the marketplace. We just began to ask God for wisdom. How do I solve the problem? We don't have to put Jesus on our sleeve every time. I just ran into this lady, Lynn Rule. That's not her picture, but just a picture of gymnastics. She's from Cincinnati. She was telling me this incredible story. This was about, well, 1990s, early 90s. She was telling me about how her daughter wanted, loved to do gymnast, um, get in the gymnast sport. And so she was developing and some coaches came along and said, your daughter has, has good, good uh, you know, great opportunity to be a great gymnast. Would you like for her to go through the program? And she said, well, what's involved? And so they explained it to them. And she says, well, I need to see what they're going to do. I need to see an example. Can you show me a gym and just let me observe? And so she went to one of the training gyms, and she was appalled at what she saw. She, they treated the children like slaves. 
and they just were really tough on them. And she said, I'll never expose my child to that. But she wanted her child to you know, have the opportunity. And so she took it upon herself to try to find another gem that had the value system of validating the children and you know, treating them like kids. And she couldn't find one. So she ended up starting her own gym, hired the person that she thought had that value system. And to make a long story short, she was so successful that she had two girls on the 1996 Olympic team, gold medal winners for the, that were in Atlanta. And she literally transformed the way kids were trained for the Olympics in, the, in, gymna in gymnastics. They would come to her and say, what, what's, how did you do this? What was your secret? And so now here she was, a homemaker, who has now become a tipping point in a major industry just because she saw a problem that needed to be solved. Then finally, there are networks. Change happens by a small number of change agents banding together. William Wilberforce was part of something called the Clapham Group. Clapham Group was 12 to 14 people who were people who had a vision for social reform in England. And because each of them had a role to play, they were able to have 69 world-changing initiatives in England. How many of you have seen the Amazing Grace? Anybody see that? Here's a good little clip from that movie. When you reach the plantation, they put irons to the fire. And do this. To let you know that you no longer belong to God, but to me. Mr. Overfoss, we understand you're having problems choosing whether to do the work of God or the work of a political activist. We humbly suggest that you can do that. So he was struggling with calling. And what we were talking about this morning is that calling is a spiritual thing. John Newton, who led him to Christ, at, he was at age 28 when he came to Christ. He thought, well, I must be supposed to be a pastor. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, said, no, you are called to politics. You are called to do what God created you to do. Sometimes we, we get that sacred-secular dichotomy mixed up. We think that this is spiritual and this is not. God says, all of life is spiritual. It's about the motive of the heart. God believes in teams. Each member has its role to play. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was a team, is a team, yet it's one, isn't it? The key factor in history is not individual genius, but rather the network and the new institutions that are created out of these networks. And the more dense the network, that is, the more active and interactive the network, the more influential it could be from a book called To Change the World by James Hunter, who's a professor at University of Virginia. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this is what they, is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. He's talking about the Babel. And yet, what we need to see in there is the value of oneness. Now their motive was wrong, but the power of oneness is what we see in that verse. And Jesus reinforced this when he started talking about in John 17, the value of working as one. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word and that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. And I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's why this gathering is important for people to build relationship, to be able to leverage what you do together. Because collectively, you can do so much more than by yourself and collaboration. 
Let's look at David and, and, and just look at the actual situations that David was in where we see these six stages show up in his life. Well, as divine circumstance, he was anointed by Samuel. And then his character development stage was fleeing Saul's sword. Then he was isolated in the cave of Adullam. Then his personal cross was a result of the betrayal by Saul and living, having to live under the authority. You see, he could have taken him out any time, but he chose the cross by saying, God, I will only be elevated through your hand, not my hand. So he was willingly refusing that, refused deliverance. And then he became a problem solver as the king of Israel. He built a temple through Solomon. And then what was his networks? It was David's mighty men was his network. Daniel is another good example, and you can look at all the characters and do the same exercise with them. He was exiled to Babylon, so crisis, isolation. Then the cross, or the crisis. King Nebuchadnezzar said, interpret my dream, not only interpret, but tell me my dream and interpret it. Now that's tough. Tough stuff there. Or you die. So he goes and finds his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, says, guys, we got a problem. We got to come up with this dream and we got to interpret it, or not only we die, but the other counselors die. God answers the prayer. What happens? He interprets the dream. He solves the problem. His life and others are spared as a result. He and his friends are promoted. God's name is protected, they're elevated, and have influence at the governmental mountain. So, how many of you can identify the journey, the stage maybe that you're in? If you're young, you know, you may, may not be able to recognize those stages yet. You may have just on stage one. But when you're young, it's good to know this, because when the, t when the testing comes later, you'll be able to look back at this, this teaching and say, oh, I remembered when that guy said, this stage, this stage, this stage. This is not an unusual stage. It's actually biblical. I know that when I first met my friend Gunnar Olsen from Sweden in 1996, and I was going through adversity, and I, I couldn't make sense of it. I said, what's happened to me? Why, why am I going through this? I've tried to do the best I can. And he said, it's not about your adversity. It's about the call. Yeah, you've made some mistakes, but your call is bigger than the adversity. And you're in a process. You're in a Joseph process. You have a Joseph calling on your life. Questions? Comments? I like what you say about problem solvers. Um, uh, a man, a gentleman in our city, who's a mentor to me, he's a, he's been counseling for 40 years. And, uh, he says sometimes people come and say to him, Peter, how can you listen to people's problems all day? Like, don't you just get crushed under the weight? He said, he said well, he said pretty early on, a mentor said to me, you don't, it's not that you're listening to people's problems, it's you're offering solutions all day long. Hmm. So, Not listening to complaints all the time, right? You know, people complain. Able to, he's in that, God put him in that position to answer that call to offer solutions rather than looking at them as problems. That resonates because, for instance, in this, if you look at this whole media, this whole medium of, of gaming, the people would look at it. A lot of a lot of Christian parents look at it as a problem. What am I going to do with my kid who wants to play games when, when we, can, we can offer positive solutions to, to what's out there? Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, well, I see, in, I see in like Silicon Valley, I'm, I live in Silicon Valley, and I see people who have been fa who is fascinated with God's creation without knowing who God is, and they find that they're more revering towards God's creation than God's children are. 
And so what I'm saying, what I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's this like disgusting feeling technophobia that's in churches, in church culture, that like, you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of times the people who are in Silicon Valley don't know God are more revering towards God's creation than the people who go to church. The people who go to church are more, are seem to be like, like, like afraid of it almost. And I just, I don't understand where that fear necessarily comes from. So, I, like, how do you, how do you convince your friends, your brothers and sisters that, that it's not evil? You know what I mean? Like, I often feel like the, the opposition is from like the people who are on their side. Well, sometimes I think. Uh, liberalism often infiltrates the church and actually distorts something that's from God as if it's not from God, you know? And uh, I think that's rooted in a religious spirit that often is permeates the church. The whole sacred secular thing is part of that to where we can't appreciate what God's doing even, even in our, what we do for a living you know, often we, we want to say, well, this is spiritual over here and this is not spiritual. And we can't validate God in, in his totality of who he is and how he's part of all of nature, all of creation. So the, the solution to that problem is a bigger problem. <laughs> and, and I think it's teaching people to come back to that under, base understanding that God is in all creation and uh, even in the secular work world of creating games or creating real estate or doing this or that, you know. It's all about the heart. You know, everything we do always comes back to that one issue, doesn't it? It's the issue of the heart, whether you're doing it out of a devotion of loving God and wanting to express his life through that call. Well, the accuser of the brethren has, you know, he does a good job at keeping that voice over us that, well, God doesn't love you. Look at all the things that happen in the world. If there's really a God, then why would he allow that to happen? And, you know, you'll never measure up to that. So there's always that voice that we have to check at the door and say, God didn't say that. You know, I often tell people, we always need to visualize this and say, okay, where, who said that? Who said that? Did, did God say that? Or did some other voice say that? Having that filter and not letting it in. Anybody else got a question? Or? I think it's good to view that cycle, you know, and have sort of names to the steps. I mean, obviously, some people circle back and go through uh, another phase, but but it's if you don't realize you're in that sequence, uh, it's, and and we're so focused just on where we are right now ourselves. If you don't have that big picture, Gary was talking about that today too. If you don't see what the story is, uh, you can basically end up a casualty. Yeah. Because you don't take advantage of what God's really trying to do because you don't know where you are and why you're there. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you, you, my wondering sometimes in reading even like a Joseph or any of those, it's wondering what did hold them together. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have this teaching. <laughs> they didn't have, you know, uh, Bobby Clinton's uh, material. Yeah. So, so when they were, you know, the, the second time... Oh, when, okay. The second time when Joseph didn't get out of prison, what you know we don't know because it's not in scripture. But what convinced him to basically say, "Okay, that's okay. You know, I've been betrayed again, but it's not the end of the story." Yeah, you know, one of the things the key to that I think was that Joseph was a really good son, and I think that because of that he was able to weather the adversity that he went through. And it says in the scripture that Joseph became the father to Pharaoh. That's interesting, isn't it? That a 30-year-old would become a father to Pharaoh. And I think because 
Joseph had such a relationship with Jacob, his father, that he honored him, he loved him. All he desired was to get back to see his father. And I think there was some type of evidence. I mean, this is a picture of Jesus and the father. Joseph is, a, a, is really a type of, of Savior, Jesus, and sold for silver, betrayed by his brothers, became a physical provider, salvation to a nation. So he's really a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, so even in the context of father, son. That's yes. an awesome concept because he didn't start out with the orphan spirit then. Exactly. He had already entered sonship so that he could become a father. Exactly. Um, I've never seen that. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I just came across a book called um, Creative Suffering by a guy named Letourneau. And in that book, there's only one little piece in there I got out of that book, and it was talking about some major leaders, world leaders, people like Lenin, Stalin. Um, uh, most of them were bad leaders, you know, uh, uh, Caesar. You know, most of them were bad leaders, but they were, were all world leaders. And there was over 300 of them that all had a common thing. And you know what the common thing was? They were all orphans. And what they were trying to make a point about is there's something in an orphan spirit that wants to change the world, good or bad. And there were some good leaders in there. But it's interesting how if we understand that we're all called to live as sons and daughters, in that intimate relationship with God versus slaves and orphans, which causes us to move into performance, just like the prodigal son, the other son lived in performance. He didn't like the fact that he was allowing his brother to receive unmerited favor, even in his failure. It's because he was living as a slave, not a son, that was based on performance. This morning I didn't get to show this one clip. I, I want to show you guys this clip. Uh, how many of you have seen the Truth Project from Focus on the Family? Have any of you seen that? You, oh, you guys have? You've seen it? You've seen it? Okay. Well, this is a testimony or kind of a clip on a guy, a Japanese artist called Makoto. And I think it's really good for us to hear perspective of art as it relates to God and the church. understands and captures this glory that is bound up in the idea of being crazy for God. I think the church needs not believing all this to learn from, to grow, uh, and to challenge by. The way I approach artists and art in general, I make this assumption first, that all expression, all art forms, um, belong ultimately to God. Of course, we twist them. Uh, we twist these good gifts that God given us and twist that into an idol and make it into something that uh, we can worship, and that happens all the time. But a Christian's task is to twist it back, to discern what is good. Unless we do that, we are left with twisted imagination um, that, that is not sanctified, and uh, therefore uh, the product of expression is always going to become more and more painted. Now the church may have left the arts, God did not. We tend to have this knee-jerk reaction to the world or simply copy mimic what's, what's there. But I think biblically speaking, the church needs to be a place, source of creativity. I think because we left culture to people who do not know Christ, 
I, I think we left it empty. A vac you know, the vacuum there is we're paying for right now because we need it to be there with these artists um, alongside of them, you know, to struggle together. But I think we didn't do that. We need to encourage our children to be in create trios. We need to be blessing them to go to New York and LA, to be an actor, to be a director, to have vision for being the next Spielbergs and being, being the next Picassos. My prayer is that the, that the church itself will be seen as a place where creative ones are drawn to. That's good, huh? Yeah. yeah. Name is Makoto. M O K O T A. You know, IAM is all over the country and all over the world. They're out on the, on the West Coast. It started in New York. It's all over the place. You can get involved in it. You can get involved in the in, in IAM, yeah. International Arts Movement. Go to the website. They have their, their good people. What's the guy's name? Let's think about the founding of some of our universities. Let's begin with Harvard. Some of you may not know, it was the first university founded in America. And it was founded by the Puritans. Look at the first rules and precepts of Harvard. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life that we've looked at. And therefore lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. The original precepts for Harvard. What about its original motto? Its original motto was truth for Christ and the church. That has now been truncated to simply veritas, truth. And I'm not sure they know what that means. Well, let's look at Princeton. What was its founding statement? Cursed is all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. What about Columbia University, one of the most liberal universities in our country today? Look at the seal that is still there. Above her head, written in Hebrew, Yahweh. At the top, from Psalm 3610, written in Latin, in thy light we see light. On the ribbon, Psalm 27.1, God is my light, written in Hebrew, under her feet, the reference to 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. When you begin to look at the founders and their statements concerning this area of education, we begin to see something very interesting. Gouverneur Morris, now you may not know who he is, but he was uh, one of the most prominent speakers during the Constitutional Convention. He was the chairman of the Committee of Style, so we actually wrote the U.S. Constitution. He said, religion is the only solid basis of good morals. Therefore, Education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. How many of you knew that about education or universities? Pretty amazing, huh? Do you know that? No, not, not that. I didn't know that much about it. I, I knew that like a lot of things in our nation was founded. Um, like it's a Christian nation. We forgot all that. Of, of over 15,000 documents they reviewed of the Founding Fathers, 94% of those documents had either a biblical phrase or reference to the Bible. We, we live in a culture where they're trying to, to revision, revisionism, tries to revise history and not give credit to what it's due. And, you know, sometimes we'll bring up the slavery issue in America, which is a legitimate issue to bring up. But 70% of the founding fathers were, were abolitionists. They just didn't have the backbone and the clout to overturn it at that time, but they were against it. And like any tradition that's so entrenched financially in a culture, just as it was in England, just as Nazis, you know, the Christians back then in Germany couldn't stand up for what they needed to stand up for. I mean. And of course, the Christian church is notorious for some of the things we did 
you know, way back. So, but that doesn't negate the fact that the founding fathers had a core belief system which motivated them to do what they did. Any, any questions on any other issue or I, I could show you guys some other clips, but yes. So is there, like, you, I'm sure you've all heard of TED Talks and stuff, right? Yeah. Where, like, they break down, you know, high-level concepts that have impact, but they break down almost to, like, layman's kind of description so that anyone can grasp it and be inspired and see what's going on. And I'm like, I feel like with these reclaiming the seven mountains, like, we need to be communicating some of the greater concepts that we're experts in to the church in a way that they understand it so they don't have to be afraid of it. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if there's like a gathering that, I feel like you would know if there's a gathering that's trying to do that, you know? Well, I think we're, we're making, you know, progress, but it's not as fast as we'd like to see it happen. But I think we're still in the early stages of this this whole idea of the Seven Mountain as a strategy for influencing culture better. And uh, I mean, we're starting to see little pockets of fruit like what we're seeing in Hollywood, just a little bit of what we touched in, in Harvard. I, I'd like to see that go on through all the campuses, you know. Um, so there are things happening. It's just not as visible as yet. Yeah, well, we're doing it through video games. Do it through video games, that's right, amen. Let me show you one more clip and then we'll just close. see things and you're not really aware of the lens you're only aware of the things you see so it becomes the glasses the spectacles the filter through which they're actually seeing life and the whole universe and the world and human life is understood through that lens on the basis of that worldview you make your momentary judgments in life so everyone has a worldview and I think it is a grid that frames the nature of reality for you in life. Now, our thinking really does govern the way we act, the choices we make. There are ideas that have consequences. And our culture is shaped, first of all, by distorted ideas that yield distorted lives. And when we do not understand or know the true claims of God, we take the true claims of the world as if they're true. When we live according to the to the lies and the illusions of the world, and we suffer deeply. God wants us to see the world the way he told us it is. Everything begins with an infinite personal God, and the whole universe and the world and human life is understood through that lens. Whether we're talking about sociology, we're talking about anthropology, we're talking about science or history, law or politics, economics, it does not matter. You can trust that God has given to us the framework of truth from which we can stand upon and live. That's the secret of freedom. That's the secret of humanness. That's the secret of fulfillment. It is the trust that he really is who he says he is and that his truth claims are really real. You can trust them with your very life and your very soul. I am convinced that that is exactly what truly transforms people. And you will find it to be one of the most glorious moments in your life. Let me just show you a couple of things as we close out. Um, couple of tools that may be helpful to you.
One of the tools we created was called mlcommunity.com, which is a social network site that uh, you can go on there. In fact, I would recommend the gaming, all you gamers, go on there and set up a, a, a group there as game, Christian gamers and begin to intersect with many of the marketplace leaders on here. Uh, we launched this about five months ago. It has uh, about uh, close to 3,000 people on it right now, but it's, it's going to grow. And uh, it's a great place to just, what happened to our connection? It's a great place to uh, connect with others, to mm -hmm. establish groups. And uh, you can put videos up there. You can put uh, your own profile up there, events, uh, forums. Um, so it's a good, good tool. It's free to use. So just another place of getting your messages out. Uh, let me go past that. The other thing that we created, uh, the devotional, you can sign up for that out there. It's free by email, and there's a, do a weekly podcast um, uh, if you uh, subscribe to podcast. And uh, let's see here. The Change Agent Network is another tool that we have that is designed. It's an online learning center. And what's on the Change Agent Network are, each month we do two teleseminars a month. And they're interviews I do with leaders across the country like Ken Blanchard or um, you know, different leaders. Um, and then we have our news teaching newsletters and then webinars which are often PowerPoints with uh, teaching. And then uh, it's the same platform as we used on the other site in, so that you can start groups, uh, a forum, you can upload videos, common workplace questions people answer in the marketplace, and then set up events. And uh, so this is a um, really, an, it's more teaching focused and, and designed to connect leaders to leaders. Uh, this program is $47 a month, but we also have an affiliate part of this so that if you refer others to, through your affiliate, you can actually earn $10 a month on that membership. So for entrepreneurs, you know, you can actually make some money on this site. So these are uh, types of, you know, people like uh, Ken Blanchard and Lance Wall now and uh, Peter Wagner and Johnny Enlow. So information uh, on our website on that and then this book comes out on Sunday you can actually access a website changeagentbook.com and download uh, a couple of chapters there and we do these weekend intensives and our whole video course will be coming out in September so why don't we close there can I leave us in prayer Father we uh, thank you for uh, these change agents in this room I pray that their time here will be really a time where they'll connect with your vision for their life, connect them to the people they need to meet, and uh, really just energize their life. And I just pray you have an encounter with each of them while they're here. So I ask you to bless them and just uh, release your purpose and destiny on each person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and hope you have a great uh, event here. Thank you. Welcome.